This is a production of Cornell University. Hey guys, and I've got a few things I want to go through, but mostly this is just information for you. So if you have questions at any time, you know, stop. Um, I'll be happy to talk as much as you guys want about any particular topic. So basically, I'll start uh, telling you a little bit about myself. So, um, you know, my family didn't have a lot of people that went to college. You know, we had a few that ended up in nursing school, but certainly nobody who went to grad school. So I was really interested in science in high school. I loved biology. <sighs> what do you do when you like science in high school, right? I didn't know, so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll try to be a doctor, because that's what you do when you don't know anything about academia or, or research or science. So I went to school you know, thinking I was a pre-med, and then the more I get into it, the more I learned, the more I thought, well, maybe that's not for me. So I, I volunteered in a hospital, and at the same time, I got a job working in a lab on campus doing research with uh, Streptococcus mutans, which probably most of you have in your mouth right now. Uh, causes cavities, hopefully not in your mouth right now. Um, and uh, I absolutely loved the microbiology research, and I absolutely hated working in the hospital. I'm still not really fond of hospitals. Um, and so the idea of being a doctor just was like, no way. And, but the more I got into the research, the more I realized I loved it. And so then, you know, from there, it's like I, I got an advisor and I was working with somebody in the lab, you know, a professor who was very helpful. And he said, yeah, you know, there's lots of things you can do with a PhD in microbiology. You know, you can do all of these interesting things. And so I went to grad school. And I didn't think I wanted to be a professor when I went to grad school. I thought I wanted to work in the biotech industry. In particular, I wanted to clean up uh, contamination in the environment using microbes. But then as I learned more about myself and as I learned more about microbiology, I realized I was really fascinated in microbial ecology and what happens in soils. Um, and that basically led me to where I am today. And so that's part of the process of like deciding if you want to go to grad school or, or figuring out what you want to do right now is getting experiences, so getting internships, like maybe at the botanical garden or somewhere else. You know, taking time to figure out what excites you and narrowing down the list of things you want to do with your life, right? I mean, that's hopefully what you guys are thinking about right now. And maybe I'll be able to help you a little bit. But my job today is mostly to give you some idea about what grad school is all about, and if you're interested in it, um, how you might get in. So there's a few things I want to cover. Um, what is grad school all about? Um, uh, why would you want to go to grad school? What you can do to prepare to go to grad school? And then how that whole admissions process works. And I'll sort of take them on in that order. So what is grad school? Grad school is um, it's basically training to become good at doing research. Right? Grad school is much more focused than undergraduate. So an undergraduate you're doing credits, you know, you're taking courses primarily. There are other things you're doing, of course, but you're getting your degree because of the coursework and credits that you're taking. You know, there's what, 120 credits you gotta take and you gotta satisfy all these criteria. That doesn't really exist in grad school. Grad school is about doing some kind of original research, right? It's like finding something where you're going to make an individual impact in a new way. And yes, you take courses in grad school, but they're very flexible and there aren't many of them. It's mostly focused on a real practical, experiential learning uh, exercise. And the real goal of grad school, you know, you're gonna have some focused area that you're becoming an expert in, but the real unifying theme is you're learning how to learn. You're learning how to, how to design research, how to perform research, and how to answer a question that it's not something you can just look up in a book, right? There's lots of questions out there that we don't have the answers to. Going to grad school is, is getting the skills it takes to be able to answer those questions. You just can't look up in a textbook. So maybe you can write your own textbook someday. Um, so in terms of grad school, there's a few different degrees you might hear about or think about. Uh, there's a, a, an MPS degree, which is a Master's of uh, Professional Studies, Professional Service Studies. Um, uh, this is a little bit less common in the sciences. Uh, typically, it's more coursework focused. It's usually a shorter program, one or two years. Um, and usually it's for somebody, you know, if you're interested in, in going into industry and you want to be a CEO for a company that makes fertilizer or one of these big ag biotech companies like Bayer, uh, Crop Sciences or something like that, 
And you know, you're going to be a manager, but you really want to know a lot about soil science so you can understand what the people who work for you are doing. That might make sense to do an MPS in soil science, for example. So you're focusing on a particular area to improve your knowledge in that area, but you're not going to go on to be a professor in that topic, right? It's much more focused. A uh, master's degree uh, is uh, very much still a research degree, you know, but what you're doing there is sort of learning how to be a scientist, um, maybe more than learning how to direct a research program. So if you want to be able to direct a research program, either in industry or academia, you really need the PhD. So the PhD is sort of like, uh, you know, you're able to identify new research topics, design a research program to answer that question, uh, get the funding to do it, manage it, and then get a positive outcome. Whereas with a master's degree, it's more like, well, you're able to do research, um, but you might not be in a position to sort of come up with new ideas or sort of direct a whole research program. Any questions about those sort of different degrees? A master's is usually two, maybe three years. Uh, a PhD can vary. The fastest I've seen somebody finish is like four and a half years, and the longest I've seen somebody take was eight years. But the eight-year student spent a lot of time abroad, and he did lots of interesting things, so he was using his time well. Is it possible to do a PhD without a master's? That's a good question. So, um, so that varies by field. And so, what I, and so there, are, there are slight cultural differences and practices across different fields. So if you're a microbiologist or a plant biologist or a chemist, you're going to see some differences. So in general, the way I like to describe it is if you're in a, a laboratory-based environment, like you're doing bench work in the lab all day, those people typically go right from the bachelor's degree to a PhD, right? They don't usually get a master's. Whereas people who do field work, you know, either ecology, natural resources, plant sciences, those people, it's more likely that you're going to get a master's degree um, before you get the PhD. And it might be more expected that you do so. Plant science is kind of funny because we've got the, uh, some of the plant biologists are like doing genomics in the lab all day. Um, and then we've got people in horticulture who are out in the field all day. And so you're generally going to see, you know, those field people, it's more common that they'll have a master's before the PhD, whereas the bench people, it's almost, almost consistently everybody just gets the PhD without a master's. So to some degree it, it varies. And, I, and my own personal, I don't, I've never heard a good explanation for why that is, but uh, the best guess I have is that if you're in a, if you're in a bench science program, you know, most of those research jobs, um, tend to be directing research rather than performing it. And so if you want to direct research, you need a PhD. And so a master's degree isn't quite as marketable if you're in a bench type environment. Whereas in those field-based environments, there are many more sort of management level positions, whether with government or extension, where that master's degree is a pretty marketable thing. And so I feel like it's kind of market driven, but yeah, that is what it is. But so if you have an advisor, if you're thinking about grad school, you know, in a particular area, that, you know, you should ask or try to figure out what the particulars are for that area. So why might you want to go to grad school? Um, number one, you should, you know, in the sciences, you should really like science uh, and really be interested in research. Um, but there are some other good reasons. So. Uh, there's a good reason in terms of uh, salary, if that sort of thing is interested, interesting to you. You know, there's sort of uh, uh, this old saw out there that, you know, if you get too much education, it's hard to get a job, or maybe you educate yourself out of a job, and that's not true. Um, so if you look at the statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which are national U.S. statistics, um, if, you get a, if you get a doctoral degree, not a medical degree, but a Ph.D., um, over your lifetime, you're likely to get 43% more salary than if you just have a, a bachelor's alone. Um, and the unemployment rate, at least as of 2015, for people with a PhD is 1.7%, which is about a third of the unemployment rate for people who have a bachelor's. So if you have a PhD, you're more employable and you're going to earn more money, if that matters to you. Um, 
And even with a master's, um, the unemployment rate for a master's is 2.4%, which is like half of the unemployment rate right now for everybody else. And even with a master's, you're going to get 18% higher salary over your lifetime than someone just with a bachelor's. Um, so if you're interested in science, you know, if you're thinking about you know, these things are important to you, yeah, it's a good idea to think about grad school. The other thing is, in the sciences, it's mostly free. Right? So if you go to get a PhD, if you go to get a master's or a research degree at a university, uh, generally you're going to get your tuition covered. So your tuition is going to be paid for by the program or by a fellowship or some other method, maybe a teaching assistantship. And you're going to actually get paid to go to school. So you're going to get a living stipend. It's not a ton of money, but it's enough to pay all your bills and cover your health insurance and everything you need while you're in school. So it's a pretty good deal. You end up with getting your education paid for. Uh, you also end up making more money over your lifetime, and you have a lower unemployment rate. So if you think it's something you're interested in, you know, it, it can be a good choice. Any questions about all that stuff? All right. So then the other thing is, how do you prepare? Right? So what can you do to prepare for grad school? Um, in terms of preparing for grad school, uh, and in terms of your application, I mean, there are really three things that you want to think about. Um, one of the things is your coursework, right? You guys have already picked majors, you're thinking about majors, you're thinking about your concentration probably if you're in the plant sciences major. Um, and so that's going to really dictate your coursework. So that coursework is, of course, important. Um, but probably the single most important thing in terms of grad school is, is real world experience. So like in my case, you know, I volunteered in that hospital. I did that research in the lab. You know, I joined the lab as a junior and I worked throughout my junior and senior years and I had one whole summer where I was working on the research. Um, uh, real world experiences, so like internships, um, uh, you know, working in the lab, independent research credits, uh, honors project. It doesn't have to be just in one lab, but, but those experiences are gonna help you to know you know, what you like and what interests you, but they're also going to really help to um, give you the skills you're going to need and sort of develop your background so that you can get into graduate school if that's a choice you want to make. Um, and then the other thing to mention there in terms of real world experience is a lot of people like to take a, a, a gap year. So, so you get your bachelor's and then maybe you're not ready to go right into grad school. Or maybe for some reason, um, you know, y you think there's something you can improve about your preparation for grad school. So a lot of people will get a job. You know, it could be a job as a technician. It could be a job on a farm. Some people go into the Peace Corps. You know, those sorts of experiences, if they're related to your area of interest, you know, if they are related to your professional sort of educational goals and why you're going to grad school, those kind of experiences are generally going to help you, right? Because when you're making an application for grad school, those people want to know, are you really interested in this? Do you have skills? And so you're going to develop that interest and get those skills, not just in the classroom. And so those real world experiences are really important. And you know, if, if you're a freshman, if you're a sophomore, it's definitely a good time to be thinking about it. If you're a transfer student coming in maybe later on, um, definitely you want to try to get you know, some of those experiences as soon as possible. Um, and there are lots of different ways to do that. Good. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is admissions. Um, but before I start talking about admissions, you guys are really quiet. Mm -hmm. And I know you must have some questions. So does somebody, because I, and I know that if you have a question, there are probably 10 people in the room who have the same question. So it would be really helpful maybe if somebody would ask, yeah. I guess in terms of preparation, how do you, what do you, what are you looking for when you're applying to a specific school? Mm -hmm. Kind of like what program they're offering or is it more? So, so you, you're asking the question from the point, from your point of view, like where do I want to send my application? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, there's a ton of programs out there. Um, and it can be hard to navigate. And I would say the first thing you need to do is figure out what you want. You know, what are your interests? You know, that, that old question that people ask you that you hate to get, what do you want to do, what do you want to be doing in 10 years, right? Um, 
you know, you need, the first thing you need to do is be answer, answer that question real well. It's hard, right? And that's why I say get experiences, because getting those experiences will help you to answer that question. You know, you have to know who you are before you know where you want to go. So if you have that bit ready, you know, then I guess there would be two things to do. The first and probably most valuable thing is hopefully you've uh, been working with uh, somebody in the lab. Maybe that's a graduate student. Maybe it's a professor. Maybe it's your academic advisor. Um, but you've got somebody in a, in a sort of mentor kind of relationship. Yeah, maybe it's Marvin here in this class, right? Um, but you've got somebody who you can talk to who has a network, right? They're a professional. They know the area. If you go to that person and you say, hey, I'm really interested in this area of study, you know, they're going to be able to tell you probably off the top of your head, okay, here's half a dozen programs you might think about applying to. And even if they don't, they probably know somebody who could give you that list, right? So, so tap into that network. When you're, when you're sort of doing research, you're developing a network of professionals. So tap into your network and ask them, and they'll provide you really good information. Yeah. And if there are other people you're working with, you know, whether it's an internship or in a lab, you know, the graduate students, ask them too, right? So, get, you know, sort of canvas your, your network and get information. And then the other thing is, as you're, uh, as you're interested in this area, you should be reading. So as you get more and more interested, you want to do more and more reading. And if you're doing research, you're probably getting papers to read. Maybe you're seeing scientific papers in your classes, or maybe you're just reading stuff on the internet. So those articles are going to talk about the science, but you're also going to see the names of people who made those discoveries. Write those names down. Right? Uh, when you see an article that has a really exciting conclusion, who's the senior author on that? You know, what institution are they at? So keep a list of the kinds of stuff that you find exciting, and then who did the work, and where are they? Maybe they're all the people doing this work are at the University of Minnesota or something. You know, that's something you want to know. So if you're reading a lot of papers, and you find that all the papers you're excited about are written by like five people, you should probably apply to institutions where those five people are at. Right? So those are really good. And then the web, you know, and then you look online. Um, that can be harder, but uh, you know, if you look for plant science programs, you know, not every place in the country has one. So you find the ones that do. If you're interested in a particular area, you know, look at the faculty bios and find a place. Like you might look at the you know, Michigan State, and if you're interested in a particular area, maybe they have only one person really specializing. And when you read their background, it looks really lame. And maybe you look at UC Davis, and they have five people in that area, and they're all really dynamic, right? Then you'd want to make that application there. So I would say use your network, you know, do some reading, you know, and then and then do that sort of web-based search. Yeah, good question. You had a question here too. How do you feel about getting like fellowships? So that's tricky, right? So so there are a couple. So funding is one of the big things, and we could talk a, lot, a long time about this. And, and it's an important thing for grad school, because you do get funded to go to grad school. But whether or not that funding comes through is one of the big things that dictates whether or not you get accepted. So when you're getting accepted to an undergraduate program, mostly they're looking at like your merit, you know, your, your GPA, the coursework you did. You know, they're, they're looking at like that whole piece. And that's certainly important for grad school, but it's only one of the pieces for grad school. You know, this funding piece is really important because um, we don't have unlimited funding. We can't just well, pay for anybody to go to school. Um, and so we have to sort of figure out how to provide that money for you. And so, so really, in the bigger picture, there's three ways, right? There's fellowships, there's teaching assistantships, um, and then there are faculty grants. Um, and and these, all three of these are the mechanisms we use to fund students. And when you're admitted, you might be admitted with one kind of support. But over the course of a PhD, you might actually move between all three. Um, and if I admit 10 students, it's unlikely that all 10 of those students will have the same kind of funding package. So with fellowships, there are two basic kinds, I would say. There's kinds that you apply for. And there's kinds that the school you're applying to will nominate you for. So the ones that you apply for, you have control over. But there aren't a ton of them. So there's like the biggest one that you guys should all know about is the National Science Foundation uh, Graduate uh, Fellowship Program. 
Um, so that's a really big program. Uh, it's competitive, but if you get funded there, it's fantastic, right? You can almost guarantee that you're going to get accepted anywhere you, you apply if you get one of these NSF fellowships. Um, the due dates are usually in the fall, so you want to plan ahead. Um, but I would very much, if you're thinking about going to grad school, you really want to look at this and think carefully about making an application. But there are other things like the Ford Foundation has fellowship programs. Um, I don't know, does USCID still have fellowship programs? But there's a lot of programs out there, and you sort of have to look around. They tend to be specialized. NSF is very broad, but, but there are a lot of specialized programs. Um, I want to say the armed services have some fellowship programs, maybe the, some of the national labs do. So you have to hunt around. Uh, the one I would recommend, because it's broad and, and almost anybody could apply for it, is the NSF program. So if you apply for your own funding and you get that from that external agency, that travels with you no matter where you go, and that's fantastic. Uh, short of that, you don't have to have that. Um, you can apply to school. The school can nominate you for a fellowship, like an internal fellowship. So Cornell has a lot of internal fellowships we use for recruiting purposes. And so, like as the director of graduate studies, I get your application. If I see your application, I'm like, ooh, this would be a great candidate for this funding. You know, I'm going to nominate you for that. You won't even know I nominated you for that. Um, if they don't accept you, then okay, I'll try to fund you some other way. But if they do, then I'll send you a letter that says, congratulations, you know, you've received this fellowship, you know, please come to Cornell. Um, so y you don't necessarily know that that's happening, but that's one way that we could fund you. So that's sort of fellowships. And then the teaching assistantships, so you know, faculty teach, we teach courses, and so we need assistance with that. And so teaching assistantships are a way that the university pays a graduate student so that for some of their time they're helping with teaching and it's capped at how many hours a week you can be expected to be teaching um, I think the maximum is like 15 hours for most assignments um, in reality you spend a, spending a lot less time than that actually teaching um, but uh, but that would be a way to sort of pay your salary and tuition as well in the sciences you do a little bit less of that if you're in the humanities they actually usually have to that they don't have as many fellowships and, and grants as we do in the sciences usually, and so they can spend a lot more teaching. Um, but but uh, TA ships aren't that onerous in the sciences usually. But so that's one way I might be able to provide your funding is my unit might have five or six TA lines, and so that means five or six people I can support with those TA lines. And again, you wouldn't know anything about that. You're going to make the application. I know I have so many slots, I'm going to try to put people in them. And then the faculty grants. So f Cornell doesn't give faculty any money um, to do research, right? They give us space and offices, but that's it. Um, when we get hired, they give us some money to buy equipment, but then they don't give us any more money. So after that, if you want to do research, you need to get grants. So National Science Foundation, USDA, uh, Ag and Food Research Initiative, uh, Department of Energy, you know, NASA, uh, you know, international agencies. We, we need to hustle to get grant money to support our research. The biggest component of that uh, money is usually people. You know, it's salaries, it's tuition, it's health insurance. And so that's how we pay for a lot of grad students. So, but that's tricky because many of these funding programs might reject 90% of the applications that you make. And so a faculty member is constantly submitting grant applications, and they can't always predict when one is going to be funded, uh, and maybe two get funded just by chance, right? So one year that faculty member might need to admit two students, and then the next year they might admit none. Or maybe three years in a row they might admit none. So, so that's a source of funding, but it's also somewhat unpredictable. So when you make an application, you know, I can't tell you where your money is going to come from, but I need to have a source of money to admit you whether it's a fellowship, or a teaching assistantship, or a faculty grant. And there's a lot that goes on there, so I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions there. Yeah. Any other questions? Good. So in terms of then, uh, in terms of ad admissions and getting into graduate school, um, I would say that really there are sort of three pieces to that. Um, uh, the, the one piece is sort of the merit of the applicant, um, sort of what you bring to the equation. Um, the second piece is something I would call 
uh, your fit with the program. And the third piece is the funding. And I think we already talked a little bit about the funding. Funding is usually a big constraint. So I would say that you know, we usually get more applicants um, who, are, who are high quality. And, and the other thing I would say is that at the graduate level, you know, if, you, if, I, if I think there's a reasonable likelihood that you're gonna be successful in graduate school, I'd like to be able to admit you, right? I mean, obviously we use merit as a criteria. We want the best and brightest. But, but really, I, I'm only going to exclude you for sure if I don't think you're going to be successful in graduate school. If I think you're going to be successful, I want to try to admit you. And so, but the reason I can't admit everybody is usually funding, right? So funding puts a cap on who we can admit, and then we're trying to admit the people who have the highest merit and have the best fit. Um, and we can talk about merit in a second, but uh, the, this fit thing is interesting because, you know, it gets back to the question you had earlier about where do you apply? Right, so let's say you know, maybe you didn't do your homework when you decided where to apply. And you applied to a university and you're really interested in, let's say you're really interested in using drones to you know, measure uh, plant health in some way, right? which is a cool thing to do. And you apply to a university where there's absolutely nobody working with drones. Right? And they look at your application and they're like, holy crap, this person has an NSF fellowship you know, they have a 4.0 GPA, they've got this wonderful internship, and they want to work with drones, but we don't have anybody doing anything with drones. Do you think they should admit you? They probably would not be doing you any favors by admitting you, because if they admit you, they might, they might admit you because you're just a great applicant and you have your own money, and they might hope that they could convince you to work on something other than drones. But if they don't have a faculty member working on drones and if that's what your heart beats for, you really have no business going to that school, right? So they should reject you um, because there's no fit. They don't have somebody who can properly advise you and direct you and mentor you in the area that makes you uh, excited, you know, what you're trying to learn. And so I would say that in general, um, fit is important. So if you're applying to a school and they don't have expertise in that area, um, that can be a problem. So more often what happens is you might be applying and let's say they do have somebody working on drones, but that person is gonna, gonna retire in a few years. And because they're retiring in a few years, they're not taking students. Again, you know, you're not likely to get accepted because they can't, you know, there's gonna be nobody there to work with you. Um, you know, let's say there's a couple of people working at that program, but both of them just took five students last year and they can't possibly take another student. You know, they're not gonna be able to admit you, right? Because they want you to work with those people. If those people can't take students, you're not gonna get accepted, right? So this fit question, they're gonna look at your application and try to figure out, you know, who at this university would this student be best suited to work with? And if they can't find anybody who's well suited to advise you, then they're not gonna admit you. Right? Even if you're a great student, even if you have funding, you know, they need to have that fit piece. And sometimes it's hard for you as an applicant to predict that, um, but you can help yourself by doing your research. Right? If you're applying to a place that there's only one person doing that research or no people doing that research, you probably might want to be careful about that. Whereas if there's like five or six people all doing the same thing, your odds of making a match are much better. Right? Um, if there's only one person, by all means, reach out to that person. Say, hey, you know, I think your research is great. I want to make an application. You know, are you taking students at the moment? Uh, do you have funding for new students at the moment? And if they say, wow, this is great. I would love to have a student, but I haven't had a grant in 20 years, and I have no idea how I would fund you, that's a red flag, right? You know, you might think, uh, let's not make an application there. So, so you can sort of weight things in your favor by doing your legwork, right? You can look at you know, who's there, how many people are there. You can reach out to them. You don't have to, like, ask them to make a commitment. All you have to say is, uh, are you, do you think you'll be likely to take students next year? You know, do you have funding for a new student at this time? And it's possible faculty are busy. They might not get back to you, but it's an easy question. And so most often they'll say, yeah, you know, there's a good chance I might be taking someone. And then you sort of put that in your notes and you say, okay, that's a good school to apply to. So, so the funding, the fit, and then, and then the merit. So the merit, I mean, the, the pieces of the application that relate to merit are your coursework, right? Um, GPA is an important thing in getting into grad school, but probably not as important as getting into undergrad, 
Um, I would say there's a wide range of GPAs that we accept into graduate school. And partially we're not as concerned about GPA just because you don't spend as much time in the classroom. You know, what we want to know is are you going to be successful in research? You know, the, the book learning isn't as important anymore. We are very interested in what courses you've taken. So if you've taken really easy classes, if you've sort of not taken important classes that we think are crucial to getting into grad school in our area, that's going to be more of a problem than if your GPA was a little bit lower than a 4.0, right? Um, and you guys are all going in the right direction because your plant sciences majors, you know, got a good core requirements. You know, you're doing the background that you would need to get into a lot of different programs in the sciences. So that's probably not going to be an issue for you. Um, so there's coursework. You know, we do look at GRE scores, right? But GRE scores, again, we don't expect perfect GRE scores. You know, most of the students we admit tend to be in the top quartile, um, but. Uh, but people below, you know, not in the top quartile, can still get accepted. It's sort of a balancing game. You know, if you have a really high GPA, but your GRE is a little lower, you know, that's probably going to be okay. So those are two components we look at, but neither one of them are sort of determinative in its own right. Um, and then uh, the letters of recommendation are really important, right? And so this is why, again, you want to have real-world experiences. Because if you take a course with somebody and they, you know, they, you're one of 200 people and, uh, you know, they can say, oh, they did really well in the final, that's not a really good letter of recommendation, right? Whereas if you do an internship or a research experience where you're working with that person closely over a whole semester or maybe multiple semesters, that person's going to be able to write a much better letter that recommends you for who you are, for your capabilities and your strengths and your interests. Um, and so getting to know, you know, professionals is a good way to be able to get good letters of recommendation. And then the last part of your application itself is your, um, your statement of purpose. And so you have to write a statement when you get into undergrad too, um, but that's a little bit more of kind of like an essay, I think. The statement of purpose for grad school, you know, I like to describe it as more like um, you know, it's more you telling your story. It's you talking about uh, where you're coming from uh, and where you're going and filling in the gaps in between. So what I like to say with a statement of purpose in going to grad school is you're trying to convince the admissions committee that you're really interested and passionate in this area that you're trying to get a degree in uh, and that you're well prepared to be successful in that endeavor. So usually you want to start off with where you're coming from. So how did you learn about this topic? So you guys are all interested in plant sciences. So you might say, oh, I got interested in plant sciences because I had this really remarkable experience once that involved a plant, right? And so whatever that is. <laughs> anybody, why are you guys in plant sciences? Did anybody have a formative experience or is like, this is the only thing that cows would accept you for? <laughs> yeah. Why did you guys pick plant sciences? Yeah. I had a cool experience interning at a hydroponic greenhouse. Yeah. Figured, hey, that looks cool. I'll learn more about that. That would be a superb way to start that kind of statement. Yeah. Somebody else? Yeah. Um, I first started working in Photoshop, and I loved it so much. I'm hoping I could be a florist, so I just picked Yeah. <laughs> Why can't you be a florist? <laughs> well, they didn't want me to. Oh, okay. Okay. And <laughs> they wanted more and better things. Okay, good. How about you? Uh, in high school, we had a career day where professionals and students came in, and two grad students came in with diseased plants and vegetables. And like, Do research on plant diseases. Awesome. Plant pathology, there you are, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right here. Um, I've worked on farms really all my life. Sure. And these, these are all great, right? So this is how you sort of start talking about it. You know, it, it's your interaction with professionals, right? Your real world experiences, you know, these are the things that ground you. And you say, hey, this is how I got excited. And then the next step is, what did you do with that information? So, okay, I, I applied to one of the best schools in the world to study plant sciences. You know, I went there and I worked with professionals and I did these research experiences and I understood that, you know, this is really what I want to do. I want to learn about plant pathogens or I want to learn about agronomy and I took coursework and I did this internship and then I did this other internship, right? And so you're sort of telling your story and then you say, and what I've really realized is I want to do X, 
You know, you, you then sort of project forward. You say, in 10 years, 15 years, I want to win the World Food Prize by, you know, increasing productivity of something or other, right? So you project forward what you want to be, and then you say, to get there, what I really need is a PhD in plant sciences from your school, right? So you're telling that story. So where did you start? What's your interest? How did that interest grow? How did you develop your skill set? Um, where do you want to get? And why is the degree at this program that you're targeting the natural, inevitable next step for you on your trajectory to a Nobel Prize? Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of Nobel Prizes in the plant <laughs> sciences. But you, you can get them. You can get them. Um, a little harder. But yeah, so that statement of purpose is important. And it's also important in terms of telling your own story. If there's something in your application package that you're worried about, or something that you want to emphasize, this is your chance, right? If you're really proud of something you did, you want to fit that in there. If there's something that was really important, you want to fit that in. If there's something you're really nervous about, I mean, it's quite common that, you know, maybe you had a real hard time in that organic chemistry class, or maybe, you know, you got a D in calculus. That would be me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe you did badly on the GRE test. Right? You don't want to ignore that because somebody's going to see it. Right? But you can tell your own story. You can say, you know, I got a D because you know, it was really a big adjustment you know, going to college and my girlfriend dumped me and my grandma died and all this bad stuff happened. But you know, the next semester I turned it around and got straight A's. You know? So I owned that and I made sure I doubled down and I improved. So then you take this thing that looks like a weakness and you turn it into a strength in a story of, of personal development, right? And so the statement of purpose lets you do that. So I think, frankly, that's the first thing I look at when I look at an application. Because if somebody is passionate and committed about what they're doing and they know who they are, that's usually pretty obvious as soon as I read that. And if they're just adrift and they don't know what they want to do and they're going to grad school because they don't know what else to do, that's obvious too. So that statement is something I think that's really important. But those f other components are the you know, statement, the GREs, the coursework, and very much, um, uh, well, I guess your letters of recommendation, and then that, that real world experience piece. So we're going to look for that. But that'll also help you to write that letter. Good. Other questions about grad school or applications? Yeah. Um, so you brought up like, what um, grad schools are looking for. But what are fellowships looking for? Mm. So that, that can vary. I mean, it, it, you, you really, um, you have to look and read the description of what the fellowship is all about, uh, number one, uh, and think about it. And then I would take that fellowship application to some professional you work with or an advisor and get their opinion on it. And then all of those programs are going to have some kind of coordinator or project manager or program officer and I would very much touch base with that person. You know, if, it, it might be that those guidelines are really straightforward and you feel comfortable. If you have any question, or even if you think it might be helpful, you know, it's okay to contact the person in charge of that program and say, hey, this is who I am, this is what I'm interested in. You know, can you give me advice on what you're looking for? You know, is this suitable? And that can be very helpful. Rare, rarely ever would that be detrimental. Um, so that can help to get information. Uh, so each program has different, you know, some of them are designed for, <coughs> you know, maybe they're designed for trying to in, enhance the number of people doing international research or, you know, people with a certain background. Um, you know, NSF tends to have different focus areas like biology or chemistry or engineering. So you'd want to sort of suss that out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the other thing you could do I don't know, we must have these resources at Cornell, certainly for NSF, but you can find out sort of who, who has gotten these awards in the past, and you should be able to sort of figure out, sort of, you know, you know get some sense as to how those people have been successful. I know we have a few programs that, sh that, that are aimed to trying to help students get those NSF fellowships, but they're sort of all over campus, so I'm not sure that I could point you towards one. I get a lot of questions about the GRE. How many times should I take it? Um, when should I start taking them? Uh, if I get a poor score, should I take it again? So you can take it as many times as you want. I, the only score that you really see 
uh, in the application is the highest score. So they don't show you like every time you've taken the test. Usually they show you the highest score. Um, so if you get a low score and you want to take it again, there is really no penalty. Because if you do worse, it's not going to show up. If you do better, it will, and the bad one will go away. Um, I mean, it costs money and time and effort to do that. So you don't just take it 20 times. Um, but no, I mean, you can take it when you feel like you're ready. It, it's not... It's not really, it's not a real heavy content-based exam, you know, so it's kind of like the SAT in that regard, where it doesn't require a lot of coursework. Um, you know, you don't have to have, like, knowledge in the plant sciences to do well on that test. Um, it is, unfortunately, one of these things where test prep makes a difference. So, you know, getting a book and reading about questions, practice questions, if you want to take a course on how to do it, those, those things do help. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, er, er, early and often, potentially. You know, there's, there's no downside, I think, to doing that. Are the subject tests um, They mm, In the past, they have had some subject tests. You know, we never get those scores, and so I, we don't require them. Uh, it used to be that some universities did. I don't even know if they still offer those. But uh, they have, in the past, had some. So, so if... So generally, they're not required. Uh, if your program requires it, you'll actually see, you know, you, and that's a good reason to look out, you know, for what programs you're interested in, because there might be a particular program you want that requires a particular subject test. But in general, no, they're not, not, not a lot of programs I'm familiar with, and particularly in the plant sciences, I'm not aware of anybody who would require a subject test. It's just the general GRE, yeah. I've covered most of the things I want to talk about. So, uh, do you guys? I mean, do you have other questions? So, so uh, what grad school is all about? Uh, I guess I didn't talk a whole lot about what you can do with a graduate degree. That's something we should talk about. Um, but preparing for graduate school or uh, or getting admitted. Anybody? Anybody have any suggestions? What What can you actually do with a PhD besides be a professor? Because you can be a professor, you have to get a PhD if you want to be a professor. But what else do you do with a PhD? What do people with PhDs do? Anybody know? Anybody know anybody who's not a professor at Cornell who has a PhD? Yeah, what does he do? Uh, well, the ones that I know are researchers at hospitals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mud, mud fuds. <laughs> MD, PhD. Oh, no. Okay. I mean, I've met those as well, but... Just PhDs. Oh, yeah. So, so, so are they uh, sort of academic, uh, like professors, or are they actually doing? Not teaching, just research. Uh, just research, okay. Good. You know, it's actually, it's sort of ironic, but if you get a PhD, you can look at the salaries of PhDs, and then you can look at the salaries of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, MDs and PhDs. PhDs always get less than MDs, which, you know, we're not disgruntled about that at all. But if you get an MD and a PhD, you actually get less money than if you had just an MD gives you a sense of how the MDs think about the PhDs, right? Uh, if you get the PhD, they're like, ah, oh, come on, what's wrong with you? Um, anybody else? Anybody know somebody with a graduate degree and what they do for a living? Yeah. Um, my sister, she did research at Berlin Oh, super cool. So, so that's, you know, very much, uh, you know, sort of a business kind of environment. So like aerospace stuff? Yeah. Oh, that's super cool. So my, my, uh, I was the first person in my family to go to grad school, but my, one of my cousins, uh, you know, she actually went to the military, and then she got uh, an, a master's in physics. So she's working in a hospital now, working on uh, these giant machines that image your body, you know, sort of re basically repairing them and making sure they work properly, which is kind of cool. It's not aerospace, but yeah. So, so academia is pretty common, I think. Boy, you know, I think I had some statistics on this. Um, yeah, so like 30 to 50 percent of your PhDs are going to be academic, you know, professors or instructors of some sort. About uh, 20 to 30 percent are in the private sector, so like Boeing. Uh, one of my PhD students is uh, working at Bayer Crop Sciences. He's, he's working in their sort of uh, um, genomic research area, so he's doing genome analyses of plants and microbes to try and find things that are valuable for the company. Um, you know, I've got other people who came through my program who are working at biotech startups in agriculture or biotechnology kind of industries. 
So a lot of people get research, either research administration or sales or technical or data positions or even writing. A lot of PhDs, you know, you get a lot of writing skill doing a PhD and those scientific writing skills are quite marketable. So about 20 to 30 percent of PhDs are in the private sector, uh, maybe about 5 to 10 percent in government. So we have a lot of scientists in particularly plant sciences and EPA, uh, USDA, uh, NRCS, uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, USGS, um, uh, even the Department of Energy, right? So, so these, these government agencies employ a lot of scientists, right? And so that's opportunities. Non-governmental organizations as well. There are international research organizations or uh, um, sort of conservation uh, organizations that you can get a job with with a PhD. So there's lots out there. Uh, in fact, probably the majority of jobs are outside of academia. Um, but they're all related to research. And, and sometimes they may not even, you know, you get a PhD in the plant sciences, you know, the skill set you have, of course it's a natural for you to get a job relating to plant sciences or agriculture or biotechnology. But that skill set translates in a lot of ways. So, you know, there are jobs in like, you could get jobs probably in the patent office, right? If you've got this knowledge, you know, they need people with knowledge because you're patenting stuff that relates to plant science all the time. And so somebody with a PhD in the plant sciences would be marketable there. You also have that skill set in terms of research, maybe da data analytics. There's a lot of big data in plant sciences. And if you know how to work with big data, a lot of the ways you work with data, whether it's DNA sequence data or census data or some corporate kind of data, you know, those computer skills are going to translate pretty well. So, so even if you're going into the, the uh, graduate degree in the plant sciences, of course you probably like plant sciences, you know, but that degree is still somewhat flexible. You know, you're not, you're not necessarily pigeonholed. And, there are a lot of, and that's why the unemployment rate for PhDs is so darn low. Good. Yeah. That's a great question. That's a great question, and I would say yes and no. So I, I think where you go, hmm, where you go is probably somewhat less important than who you work with. Um, and so the reason for that is because your training is going to be very strongly influenced by the program of the of the person you're working with, your mentor. They have a professional network. They're known for a certain thing. They're good at a certain thing, and they're going to be training you in that area. So if the world expert in, in using drones to measure agronomic variables is at uh, you know, uh, Humboldt State in California, not to like demean Humboldt State, but, but say you're at Humboldt State, you're probably better off going to Humboldt State if that's your area of interest, rather than like going to like a Harvard or Stanford if there's nobody doing that thing at Harvard or Stanford. I mean, yeah, you'd have this fancy degree, you know, but if you're interested in is being a leader in that area, you want to get trained from a leader in that area. And professionals know that. You know, like, so I'm a microbiologist. I know, you know, there aren't so many microbiologists out there that I don't know the people in my field. I know them. And so I know if you came from a particular area, I know something about you. You're going to have certain skills. I'm going to have certain expectations. And that's based on the person, not the place. Um, it might differ a little bit if you're interested in industry. It, you know, if you're working in an area outside of your focus. So if you're in the plant sciences and you're staying in the plant sciences, who you work with is probably more important than where you go. But it, the further you get away from that core discipline, so if you're getting a job in a biotech industry where they don't know anything about plant sciences or you want to get a writing job, you know, they might be more impressed by the place rather than the person, right? So I won't say that the place doesn't matter, um, but it matters more the further you get away from the focus and the more you're maintaining that focus, probably the less the place matters and the more the person matters. Good? And that's again where as a student, you don't always know who the best people to work with are, but that's why you want to develop a network while you're here at Cornell. Because the people who you're going to be working with, your advisors and the graduate students and the postdocs, they'll have a sense and they'll be able to tell you, oh, if you're interested in this, you probably want to work with one of these three or four people. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So say my, my wife has a PhD in information sciences. Oh, that's great. And she runs a very small 
information technology company. It's basically her and my son. Yeah. They do website development. Yeah, starting your own companies, that's another thing. Yeah. If you don't want to work in academia, yeah. but you want to make your own job, if you want to be your own entrepreneur, having that PhD after yeah. gives you a level of credibility yeah. that the other people... Because you're able to, you know, you're, you're, you've got a director level position. You can identify a research project and then lead that project. And, and whether that's in academia or, a, or starting a company, it's the same, same skill set. I mean, in, in a lot of senses, you know, being a faculty member is kind of like running a startup, you know, because all of your funding comes externally and that's like capital investment, right? So you're basically always drumming up capital to, to do your research. So there's a lot of relationship between starting up a small company and being an academic, so oddly enough, in the sciences at least. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? I, I, again, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover. But there's probably a million questions we could answer. What about taking time off between graduation and grad school? Yeah. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? So, so I like to tell people, um, you know, if you want to take, it depends on what you do with the time. So, so the best case scenario if you're taking time off is you're doing something that relates to your area of interest. So, uh, for example, and it might actually be strategically important for you to do that. So the best case is, let's say you came in as a transfer student, and let's say you didn't have a lot of opportunities to do research while you were here at Cornell. And you remembered, you know, Dan Buckley at this talk told me that I should have a lot of research experience before I go to grad school. Okay, well, you know, with your undergraduate degree, you can probably get a job as a technician, either in a company or maybe in a research lab somewhere on campus, maybe here at Cornell. So then you work for a year or two doing research in the plant sciences, something related to, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but something close to what you're interested in. So then you apply for grad school, you're actually gonna be much stronger, you know, with those two years break than you would have been right out of undergrad because now you're coming with this uh, background, the skill set, another good letter of recommendation and probably a stronger statement of purpose because you, you know better who you are and what you wanna do. So to the degree that, that you take a gap year or years and you're doing something relevant and that's part of your story, part of your arc, you know, to get you where you wanna go, then it's a great idea. Um, if it's totally unrelated, then it's not as good of an idea, right? The longer you're out of grad school doing something that's not relevant to this goal, you know, people are gonna be like, well, what were you doing? You know, if you're really interested in going to grad school for X, why did you spend five years doing something totally different? You know, I mean, and maybe you have a good reason for that, and maybe you can justify it, but it's gonna raise some question marks. People are gonna be like, well, why did you, you know, go mountain climbing in the Andes for five years when you, what you really want to do is molecular biology in the lab, right? So maybe you're cl mountain climbing in the Andes because you're c trying to find a rare plant that you want to study, you know, the molecular biology of, then it makes sense, right? But, but you just have to think about how that fits into your story. Yeah. Good. <coughs> Anything else? No? This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.